Um, I have to, first of all, apologize um, for uh, representatives of Poly Real, uh, Poly Real Estate um, who wanted to be here but were not able to secure visas on time to accompany us. So we have at the end of the presentation a video uh, uh, from the man general manager of Poly Guangzhou, Mr. Wu Jia Q, who will uh, also just communicate his thoughts on the building at the end of the presentation. So. I wanted to start the presentation by saying that when we embarked on the design of this building about the turn of the 2000, 2001, 2002, we set ourselves really to make a landmark. Um, and at that time, we played with concepts which today are sort of commonplace. The idea of place making, the idea of workplace, the idea of sustainability, and the idea that a building, a high-rise, should actually reflect the culture and the place in which it is built. So all these words today are commonplace, but back then some of those words didn't even exist. They weren't really part of the currency with which we describe buildings. We have done numerous projects for poly real estate, and I will say also that we attribute some of the uh, many uh, 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 things we've been able to achieve to a client that has been willing to take risks with us. So Maverick buildings really take Maverick clients and Poly Real Estate really has been a ma Maverick clients for us. The two buildings you can recognize Poly Guangzhou in the center on the right is Poly Beijing, and this is a building that was being designed also out of the San Francisco office. And so we had a team under my leadership designing Guangzhou, and there was another building being designed um, uh, for Poly, the same client in, in Beijing. And so there was a bit of a competition between the two teams, very healthy. And I think we set out to do landmark buildings and innovative buildings in both places. The site is in Guangzhou. Uh, Guangzhou has become a really a metropolis, but back in 2001, 2002, it was not the place that it is today. And so presenting innovation and pursuing concepts that are truly innovative back then was a challenge. Many times we had to create real uh, life mock-ups of concepts and ideas that at that time, we're well established in the US and in Europe, but not really in Guangzhou. Things have really changed. I think that Guangzhou really has, in many ways, surpassed um, uh, uh, some of our cities in terms of the progressive agenda that some of these technologies actually embraced back in that time. The site was right across from, uh, the Pearl River from the historic center of the town. And it kind of looked like this. So this slide is important for a number of reasons. Number one, it kind of sets the tone of how do you actually make a place and how do you design to a place? One of the things that we try to do is to recognize the characteristics of a site that are really character forming. And in this case, we actually had a beautiful uh, hill with a pagoda on the side and this inlet of water which really came from the river. And so, the idea for the whole complex was really to create a place that could bring together the two types of landscapes that could frame the idea of the river and the pagoda coming together. There is a concept in Chinese landscape called borrowing from the scene or borrowing from the distance. And so we learned from those ideas and incorporated these principles into the design of the complex. The other thing that is important about this slide is that Mark Sarkeesian, partner of our structural group, is also shown in the right. And we practice a type of discipline where the integration of uh, different disciplines is really key to what we do, architecture and engineering and all uh, disciplines. I, uh, in preparing this presentation, I took out a number of slides that are very old and kind of nostalgic, but I think more indicative of the design process and the ideas of the project. So one of the first ideas we, uh, we came about is really a very simple type of composition for the complex. There was really, as you see, very little context except for the pagoda and the river. And so the idea of diagonally linking 
the pagoda, which would be on the lower left, lower left side hand side of the slide, and the river on the on the right was central, and designing a courtyard that could bring these two <clears throat> landscapes together and create a context that was pedestrian and was human, and also that could recall some of the culture of place. We offset two towers, and I have to say also that these are not very tall buildings by today's standards, it's 180 meters, but they're certainly maverick in the way in which they postulate and they present ideas that I think still today are examples of where we should be heading with high-rise design. There was a proposed uh, hotel building north of that, uh, and you can see it uh, up, uh, not north, but to the, to the west. Uh, it's a Shangri-La. And so we offset the, the towers in order to create a corridor of ventilation and light into the project. And then at the very top, there is a uh, piece of what is a very large uh, exhibition center for all kinds of products manufactured in the region. Um, and the concept for the tower was to create, uh, from the client standpoint, to create a headquarters building, which is the one facing closest to the, uh, at the north side close, uh, facing the, uh, the river, but also space that could be leased for companies that wanted a small type of footprint or space associated with the, uh, with the, with the exhibition hall. Here you can see the beginnings of this weaving of the landscape and uh, creating a, a ventilation light corridor that brought together both the water of the, of the river and the hill type or hillside type landscape of the pagoda. Linking these buildings at the bottom were two podium pieces which are uh, very narrow spaces also used for, uh, for exhibition that again were able to uh, frame the, the, um, the courtyard with covered passages, covered walkways that uh, allowed for the circulation around the complex um, uh, at open air. And, and this is an important concept that actually permeated through the whole project, the idea that we could actually create non-conditioned spaces that you could use to circulate. So some of the lobbies are actually open at the base of the building and also the circulation around. And then at mid, at mid height on the buildings, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but there are amenities that we introduced as way, ways of actually incorporating some of the mechanical and structural uh, systems, but also as a way of creating an amenity. Uh, back then in, in, in China, you were required to have a refuge level or refuge floors. All of you that designed uh, projects in China are familiar with this. But we wanted not to have a throwaway uh, 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 space, but to really leverage it and use it as a way of creating identity and creating amenities and also allowing some of the wind to actually move through the building. This is the mature site plan. The garden really here is, was developed really as a series of types of spaces. On the north, you have a series of cascading water features that, uh, uh, that, that are related to that water inlet. At the center, there is uh, an, uh, the water feature really becomes a little bit uh, less formal with a series of different plantings and a grove of palm trees. And then in the south and north in front of the towers, you have um, uh, uh, surface parking areas that have been completely vegetated with uh, groves of trees. And on the flanks, you have also a series of groves of trees that protect you from, a, uh, from the bridge. Uh, there's a bridge that ends right at the north here. And on the other side, the property that is adjacent to the, uh, to the west. Here is a a photograph of the, of the finished uh, landscape with some green uh, roofs that were also incorporated as amenities for the tenants. And I mentioned uh, the idea of uh, how, how can we really look at uh, these buildings, these projects that we are charged in designing and really anchor them in this idea of place. And I, I showed you the idea of water being central to the courtyard. This is a small garden, historic garden and, and, and house in, in, the, in the province of Guangdong. And we were very interested in the idea of water, but also in this idea of the pavilion uh, scale of the buildings around this and the way in which roofs and screens were used as a way to incorporate semi-open spaces into the house. And we brought some of these ideas of screening and of detailing and of wood 
uh, to create a perimeter around the garden that really brought a human scale to the towers. Um, these structures are also small, but they are also interesting in terms of how the architecture and the, um, and the uh, structure work. The one that you see is, uh, has a few columns, two columns there on the left, actually is two structures, you don't see it, but half of it is really supported by columns, and then as it approaches the tower, the columns disappear, and that span is supported by, uh, by cantilever beams coming off of the piers of the, of the tower. And so it creates a series of layers of scale and materials that humanizes the context, makes a place out of a place that had no identity. So when it comes to the towers, how can we then make a series of towers, design a series of towers that again respond to culture and place? And I think one of the key ideas is to really leverage as much as possible passive strategies and responses to the environment. These anchors are buildings much more firmly in the idea of a particular place. And so these buildings were oriented towards the north. All of the, all of the lease spaces actually have views towards the river. And it's, it's a fairly narrow floor plate, uh, but it is in terms of its lease span, uh, pretty common, it's about 13 and a half lease span. Uh, but they're oriented north, so all of the faces looking north do not require, in the end, did not require any kind of shading. We were able to use very clear glass. Um, on the east and the west, we brought out the stairs and other amenities, which I will show to protect from the eastern and western exposure. And then we develop a series of layers uh, from the view plate at the north, the lease space, and then a unique structural system that then um, inhabited this space between the lease space and what typically is called the core, although I don't think that core is necessarily the right word. Um, core typically refers to a series of services, stairs, bathrooms, etc., that are encased in concrete and where no light and ventilation really comes, comes in. Here we tried to do something a little bit different. Here is a plan. Uh, one of the requirements really it was also to be able to have a more intimate type of floor plate where people could break up into smaller type of communities. You can see that there is light on both sides, north and the south. And on the south, the structural system actually plays an important role in shading the, uh, the office space. The areas within that spine, structural spine, that are directly adjacent to the space are occupied by, by, by services that need that kind of adjacency, the mechanical systems, the telecom, and the electrical. And then beyond that are spaces with the elevators, the stairs, and the bathrooms uh, that typically don't have light, but we were able to actually uh, provide views and light for all of these spaces. So one of the central ideas here is that um, these spaces which are typically serviced could actually become part of the suite of architectural spaces or developed spaces in the context of a workplace. I also wanted here to refer to um, other buildings that were designed by SOM in the 50s, the offset core typology. So we were also interested not only in a new building, but how does this relate to typologies of the past? And how can we evolve this typology in a direction that is unique and innovative? And I think that there is still a lot of work to do in looking at typologies that we've developed over the past, learning from them and evolving them in new directions, questioning the typology. This is an elevation of the North Plain. As I mentioned, we could use very clear glass. Um, and then this feature, which is the central uh, aperture that provided an amenity with some conferencing facilities which are shared for all the floors. This is also the transfer level for the elevators. It is also the transfer level will outriggers, and I'll show you the structural system a little bit, where that, uh, the outriggers actually present itself to transfer loads. Um, again, it's not a very tall building. The idea of repeating the building twice it's not exactly a copy or a mirror image from each other, but it reinforced the idea of a headquarter and a, an iconic uh, complex. Very narrow section, what you see in green is really an elevation. 
gives you an idea of the depth of the floor plate. It is, again, 13 meters from the column to the outside. And this is the, th the south elevation, which plays uh, a, a very interesting uh, role. We were interested in this idea of screening and how we could design also uh, or utilize the structural system uh, to, to, to do uh, more than just the structure. And in this case, it actually provides 100% shade on the south side of the, of the building and alludes to these ideas of filigree and of screening. So the structural system is not just expressed on the outside because, but it is also playing the role here of providing um, 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 uh, shading. We studied many different patterns and patterns of uh, meshes. We, in the end, settled for a very direct type uh, uh, expression of the diagonal in two layers, two cords, and then we tested these um, um, in terms of the, their performance during the year. A very quick run through the structural system, which is quite unique and complex. Here is a plan. Um, at the outer side, we have what's called the end frames. These, have, these are diagonalized. Inside, there are three outrigger frames, which you see there in red, and which have a transfer outrigger at the area midway through the uh, span of the building. You can see it there in the section steel outrigger truss. So we took advantage of that area, created an amenity, but also used it to transfer the loads. We have three other outriggers, which are simple frames, typical internal frame. And then we have, at the north, we have a moment frame perimeter. At the back, it becomes a little bit more complex. That first cord is a uh, moment frame, but it also has a, uh, a brace frame. And then outside of that, towards the south, there is another brace frame, which create this filigree and complex type of structure and shading device. So this is the low-rise plan below and the high-rise plan above. The slot that you see at the core is really the result of the transferring, the dropping off of the low-rise and then moving a couple of pieces in the core to create the slot that further brings light into that corridor connecting the services and allows at the upper register of the building to really uh, wrap around glass uh, around the restrooms and, and uh, bring light on both sides is a diagram of the core showing the different program. Uh, so again, exploiting the idea that these spaces could be architectural and not abandoned spaces inside the middle of a core. Um, the building features natural ventilation. It also features a underfloor air distribution system. That was the first in Guangzhou. It has glass elevators. Those were the first in Guangzhou back then. Um, and it has a series of other features that, uh, again, talking about sustainability, really were the first. They were first in Guangzhou, but they were the first also in many places um, um, in, um, uh, at that time. Another view of the building core in the back, uh, the back facade. So because we were able to relieve the core of uh, the structural, the primary structural burden of the uh, building, we were able again to bring light into spaces like this. this is the main lobby with uh, glass eleva elevators, light filters through this, and it also celebrates the technical innovation and the technical aspects of the building. So not only the structure, but also the vertical transportation systems, the connecting stairs. And this is a typical office uh, floor lobby where again the light filters from the elevator and the core in and you can see directly all the way to the outside from the from the lobby We hope to Zhujiang to create a new and development 的一个新的商务区
，这些都是为适应自然，呃，气候的必要设计特色。珠三角地区历来是中国活力十足的商贸核心地带，因此，江景成为和该项目不可缺少的象征性价值。塔楼的创新设计早就高度开放宽阔的北面视野。还有玻璃电梯、楼梯、呃，卫生间和露台都是明亮通透的空间。广州的热带气候适合采用密集和开放组合的绿色空间。项目两塔楼之间的中心地带是一个中抽象的中式庭院，内种各种植物，图以水景设置。其中一道景观通廊斜向穿越，呃，那个园林，将项目地块一边处的珠江沿岸和另一端的历史爬州塔进行串联。天窗上的水景将自然光从花园层汇聚到地下会展空间。塔楼西侧的露台，除了作为开放空间外，也起到遮阳落日、霞光的作用。各塔楼正中高度位置的通风露台，让风从三十五层结构中通流通，并作为紧急避难层。这露台层设置了三层高的休闲厅和会议室，是塔楼内的社交枢纽空间。在我们使用这栋楼的十年里面，明亮的办公环境和高效的交通流线助力保利数千员工在这里的健康工作。也见证了保利地产不断迈向高峰，牢牢占据中国地产潜力的卓越表现。SOM 作为我们长期的合作伙伴，在全国范围内和我们保持着密切的合作。北京保利国际广场、珠海海外总部、昆明保利中心等项目遍布全国。今年底，我们即将搬到 SOM 为我们设计的新总部大楼——广州天目塔。期待我们与 SOM 共创城市未来，一起铸就新的篇章。Thank you very much.